Hello once again, this is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College, and we've been going over the PowerPoint presentations for Murox, HTML5, and CSS3 as part of the AWD, Application and Web Development 1000 Web Technologies class. We are in Chapter 13, which is on fonts and printing. We have three applied objectives and six knowledge objectives. Our applied objectives Use the CSS3 at font face selector, Google Web Fonts, or Adobe Typekit Fonts to embed fonts in a web page. Use the at media print selector to add the styles for printing a page to the style sheet for displaying the page. Use the second style sheet that should be used for printing a page. Those are applied in our knowledge and general terms describe how the CSS3 at font face selector works in general terms describe how google web fonts and adobe typekit fonts work in general terms describe the way you format a page for printing describe three ways that you can provide the styles for printing a web page describe the use of the display page break before page break after orphans and widows properties for printing a page and explain why in inches it is off why inches is often used as the unit of measurement for a printed page. All right. So as we start, this chapter talks a lot about a new CSS3 feature that can be used to embed fonts within web pages. That way you know the fonts are available to the browser. You can always use third party, also use third party fonts like Google Web Fonts. All right. So, if you want to be able to import a font, so this is where you find the fonts that you currently have, okay? And as it says here, and this is from the slide on page 457, to import a font, you copy the, the file for the font family into the folder for your website. In the CSS for the page, you create a you code a rule set for the add font fade selector and use the font family property to provide a name for the imported font family and use the source property to locate said file. To apply an imported font to an HTML element in the rule set of that element, you use the name that you gave the font as the value for the font family property. And you list one or more other font families in case the browser doesn't support that one. Now, the Google Web Fonts website, as it says, if you go out to google.com fonts, uh, there there was 671. I think now it's more like about 850, something like that. Eight hundred and forty-eight. So there are plenty that you can choose from, all right? So you can read this, but it talks about how to select and use Google Fonts. I just showed you how to go to the web page, and what you do if you want to select a single font is you click the Quick Use button, or you can click the, you know, choose multiple fonts by clicking the Add to Collection button for each font. Then you complete the four-step procedure for using fonts. And that procedure basically involves including, selecting the styles and characters that you want to use, adding the link element that imports the font to the head section of each page that will use the font, and using Google Web Font Name as the value for the font property. And I believe they show you an example right here it'll give you the actual URL that you just pluck into your link statement basically and then you add that particular font and then you apply it so this says we want to go to the Google fonts family we want to use the sorts mill Gaudi file here we're saying we want to add the sorts mill Gaudi to our h1 we put it in and boom it'll be in there Adobe also has uh, I believe it's free the Adobe Edge Web Fonts is a free Adobe service that lets you use any of the fonts in their current collection. Now it says 500. Let's check. 
Adobe Edge Web Fonts. Yeah, still says over 500. Okay. And here's the process for selecting. It's not all that different from what we just looked at. Okay. All right, so to continue on, the next thing that's discussed in here is how to, f to define style sheets and rule sets for the printed page. Now, one thing to realize is that when you print something, okay, you're going to probably make a lot of changes. If you want to print on a website, there's a lot of things that, that are shown when you show it on screen that you probably don't want to print out. Plus, you probably want to make sure that it's, you know, with most of it, it's going to be black and white anyway when you print it out. So, one way to define the rule sets for the printing of a web page is to code a special, a separate um, style sheet. And when you do that, you should always make sure you put it after. First of all, you put print, media equal print in there, but you put it after the other one because you're going to be overriding a lot of the stuff that's in there. Another way is to add a media query at the bottom and basically put it down there. And a third way is to provide styles for printing is to use the style element in the head section. That's probably the least advisable one because again, what you're doing then is you're putting a style tag, so you're putting CSS actually inside of your HTML. Now the author gives some excellent recommendations here regarding print formatting. Change the text color to black and the background color to white. Change text other than headings to a serif font to make the text easier to read when it's printed because that serif is basically is a font for printing. Use a base font that's easy to read when printed. Keep your line length to 65 characters or fewer. That's a really important one. You want a little margin in, in there when you print it out. Remove site navigation. You can't use it anyway from the printed page. Remove as many images as you possibly can. By default, as it says, most browsers don't print background colors, images, and gradients. Users can change an option that controls this when the page is printed, though. Because of that, as it said, you should remove any backgrounds that you don't want to have printed. Now, some of the properties for printing, rather. The display is a keyword that determines how an element is displayed. Block, inline, and none are the ones you typically use before. Page break before is a keyword that determines if a page break is allowed before an element's box. Typically, you'll choose always, auto, or avoid. Page break after is the same kind of thing, but it determines when a page break is allowed after an element's box, and it's got the same common keywords of always, auto, and avoid. Page break inside determines when a page break is allowed within a box, and again, the possible keywords are auto, avoid auto and avoid no always there orphans is an integer so it's a whole number that determines the minimum number of lines within an element that can be printed on the bottom of a page when a page break occurs within an element and widows is an integer that determines the minimum number of lines within an element that can be printed on the next page so if you don't want an element to be included when a page is printed, you can set its display property to none. Then no space is going to be allocated for the element's box. The auto keyword for the page break properties indicates that a page break may occur but doesn't have to occur. The avoid keyword tells the browser to avoid a page break if possible. Although the widows, orphans, and some of the page break properties aren't supported by all browsers, Typically, they'll be ignored if the browser doesn't understand it. 
by default most browsers you know we already mentioned that I'm not gonna even hit on that again so here's a page web page with two columns this includes the screen and print styles okay so it looks like that here and probably when you print it out it's gonna look more like this you can see in many ways it's very blandish looking you can see some of the stuff we don't have the navigation all right we don't have the aside that's over here we just have the all right everything else basically so this is the same page that was presented back in chapter six that we added to in chapter seven and we put the figure caption on in chapter nine In the CSS for the article, the CSS column count is used to set that and to say that it contains two columns. IE9 doesn't support that, so you're not going to be able to get around or be able to use that. So the actual printed page, again, we looked at. So the changes to the printed page, again, the navigation is not shown. The heading text and borders, if you notice, we've got color in here. Everything is set to black. The article is made a little bit wider. The font for the text has been changed to a serif font so it's easier to read. As far as the associated um, CSS for this, that's shown on page 471 in the text. All of the rules in the print style sheet override those in the style sheet for the screen. Remember, it has to come after it. So the, the media equal print has to come after the first the regular style sheet. The width of the body and article are set up to auto, so they will be as wide as the printed page permits. The font family is set to a serif font. The display properties for the navigation bar and sidebar are set to none, so they're not included. The borders for the header and footer are set to black. And to set the margin and padding, you use inches, which makes sense because you're using an 8.5 by 11 printed page. And that pretty much is it for this chapter. This is, again, is a short chapter. All right. In the next chapter, which is the last one I'm going to do for today, um, we come in and we talk about how to use CSS3 transitions, transforms, animations, and filters. Okay. So I'll be back with that presentation shortly.